Welcome to Soul Night Live number 74. Today, my guest is Carl Verheyen. All right. Hey, Carl. Thank you for taking time out of your day to come by and talk about your new album, Sundial. Yeah, man. Uh, Thank you for having me. Well, it's my pleasure. You know, um, I'm a guitar player from way back. You know, I think I started playing in the early 80s. And um, good, good. I guess where I first heard your name was in some of the guitar magazines I was reading, like uh, uh-huh. Guitar for the Practicing Musician. And oh, yeah. Such. Yeah. And um, I'm trying to remember now, I want to say, did you do some of the transcribing for those back in the day or was it just instructional? Yeah, what I did was I think I wrote a monthly column for them for about three years. And then um, and then that kind of ended. They became guitar. They were guitar for the practice musician. Then they became guitar. And then that ended. And a few years later, I did it for guitar player for three or four years, three okay. and a half years. Okay. So, yeah, I've been, you know, and then um, it's funny. There's a magazine called Guitar and Bass in Germany, but they also, they're also translated into France. Mm-hmm. And I've been, I've done co- monthly columns for them. One for, I think it's called Chitare Magazine in Italy. Did one for them for like, you know, six months to a year or something like that. And, uh, and guitar techniques in England. So I don't know why these magazines find me, <laughs> seek me out. So, well, you're just very articulate when it comes oh, well, to good. all this stuff. So, you know, <laughs> good to be. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, you know, I vaguely remember a column where you were talking about doing the session work for, uh, what was it? Suddenly Susan? Was that the TV show back in the... Yeah, I remember doing all those, yeah. Yeah, I remember you talking about that. And I kind of like that you kind of gave us the insider's kind of perspective, you know. I oh, mean, cool. I think some of your columns were more about, you know, technical things, but a lot of them were more about the biz and what you're going to encounter and what you go through, um, you know, in your set, studio work and all that. And playing with Super Tramp as well. I'm pretty sure there yeah. were a few columns about that, if I remember. Yeah, the business of making a living, I mean, a, a lot of guitar players don't know what that's all about and how to deal with it so sorry about my phone it's ringing off the hook <laughs> just just one of those prank call or uh you know calls that you oh, they're get. going write another column for us carl <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> Come on, man. yeah um yeah i always like if i ever do a master class or something i try to t- teach people things beyond just playing there's a lot of things you need to know about just how to make a living and uh and you know, if I've always felt that if you um, if you can play heavy metal, you get this big of a wedge of the pie, right? Just this little wedge. Right. But if you can also play rock and blues and jazz and fusion and country and blue ga- bluegrass and rockabilly, you pretty much get the whole pie. You know, gypsy jazz in there. You know, so it it occurred to me at some point that um, better not to specialize because uh, you, you, you don't, there's not as many opportunities to work. Sure. But then that even goes beyond musical styles into, you know, uh, income sources for the, for the modern musician. You know, there's, there's band leader, there's arranger, there's producer, there's merch salesman, there's educator, you know, touring artists. There's all kinds of ways to make a living that, are beyond just uh, being a session guy or being a songwriter, you know, so. That's good. I think it's important for somebody, you know, like you to point out the options because I think a lot of people don't really think down the road very far. They just think, you know, I want to, I want to play good. (laughs) Right. I want to play better and, 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 you know, but you have to sometimes, well, here's another thing that my, my, my brother, who's not a musician, but he's a businessman, right? He says, in business, you need to reinvent yourself every five years. And that, that hit me pretty hard when he said that, because that, that really means that, I mean, think of where the music business was five years ago. Streaming was in its infancy, you know, or maybe 10 years ago. And you, you really have to say, all right, this income is kind of drying up over here, but maybe I can make something happen over there and, and, and think a little bit ahead of the game. So it's funny we're talking about business because... Uh, um, I've just got this new record coming out and the way I'm trying to work it is to offer free shipping to everybody in Europe for a limited time because okay. it occurred to me that shipping a $15 CD to England was $16 and 25 cents more right. than the media itself. Right. Right. Basically. So I had, I had CDs made in Europe. And I'm offering free shipping from a guy that, that's, 
I got a warehouse over there where a bunch of, I keep a bunch of gear. And uh, the guy that runs that is, uh, he takes lessons from me. So I said, hey, as they add up, just tell me when you're ready for a free lesson. You know, you do all the shipping and, and uh, you, you pay for it all and stuff all the manila envelopes or whatever they are, the padded envelopes. And so it's just these little tiny business decisions that, you know, you might, you know, to get, he's in Germany. So to ship to Switzerland is 3.80, 3, 3 euros 80. And that probably adds up to being five bucks. So you're really only getting $10 for your CD. But mm -hmm. hey, man, I'd rather have it out there than sitting in a garage somewhere. In That's a, a great incentive. And it's a good incentive to get the physical product rather than just download it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's a whole lot of that downloading thing going on, obviously. And that's cool too because there's absolutely no nothing I need to do beyond say thanks, you know, uh, sure. thanks for your support. But um, I don't know about you, but I'm the the older I get, the more I get into good audio. So I have a great CD player, right? A mm -hmm. really high end. So the, in other words, the converters in it are really good. And while you're mixing the album, when you're hearing mixes back and forth with the guy that's mixing it you're kind of hearing it through your computer and the the dig, the analog out of that is just through a mini plug right through a headphone out mm -hmm. and it's 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 the cheapest converters possible so when you finally get a CD you go wow this sounds great same with vinyl you go what a difference so for christmas this year i got myself a killer turntable <laughs> oh yeah really, what brand is it in it i bought i bought one called a riga r-e-g-a and it's called the planar three and it's made in england and it's a beautiful turntable but it's i used to drive a porsche for years and it had you know no cup holders no navigation no no room for guitars no, no room for guitars three <laughs> guitars could fit in what i call the greenhouse in the back right. so it, it had uh, you know it was a stick shift and no bluetooth you know, they just want you to drive, forget it, you know. So this turntable is kind of the same way. You have to pick it up when it gets to the end of the record. You have to lift oh, yeah. it off and move it. And it, it doesn't I have any I think the best ones, the best ones are like that. Yeah, yeah you know. nothing automatic. No, or not like when we were kids. Remember the thing where you could like put like a stack of them on the big spindle and they right, drop? Right, yeah. And Watch the spindle drop. It's so bad for those, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. It's rubbing them together like that. But I've been, getting into, I've been getting into like, you know, the quality of life factor of just enjoying great sounding music as opposed to MP3s, which sound awful and, uh, you know, all that stuff. So. Well, you know, a lot of guitar, like I'm, I'm working on some music myself right now. I'm kind of made myself a new year's resolution to get down the hall and record a new piece of music every week. Good for and you. So far I'm on track. I did kind of a gypsy jazz thing with mandolin and 12 string acoustic today. And, Oh, or nice. this week and it's such a nice blend those two double string yeah, that really works. that's a good secret weapon oh know. it's delicious everybody yeah. that hears it's just like wow this sounds like old genesis or something yeah yeah it's really yeah. a different thing isn't it yeah it's beautiful it really is and um i don't know what my point was oh my point is that sometimes i just i'm in it for the textures you know yeah. some records it's just like yeah, this song isn't that amazing, but boy, the sound, the textures and the tones on it really knock me out, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's my thing, too. You know, we, we're way past the whole being fascinated by shredding. You know, it's like, okay, whatever. You can teach a monkey in a spacesuit suit to do that. Well, I want to hear what kind of textures and tones they can get together and make something new and interesting. Right. You know, I just, it, to me, it's like painting, a, a doing a painting with all the colors in the paint box yeah, rather yeah. than just gray and light gray which is what right. you get with a lot you know, of what metal for, what i always try to do is i try to make a record that bears repeated listening in other words you hear it the next time and you go wow i didn't know there was a there was a rickenbacker 12 string in that little part right there or i didn't know there was like a dane electro twangy thing going on underneath that vocal you know so i try to make a record that, that are that way that have the textures and have little surprises and things that that happen throughout that make you uh, want to hear it again oh yeah that that ear candy you know it keeps yeah, revealing candy. itself you know some of the greatest albums from the 70s were like that as well i know and, you're so right you know them. a great a great record for just amazing guitar textures and overdubs is uh new kid in town by the eagles when you when you check that record out 
closely, you'd go, wow, what a, they got a lot of different things going oh, on. Oh, it's so meticulously put together. Yeah. And I love that tune. You know, I love the way it modulates from E up to G and then back to E because yeah. it's really subtle. You almost don't, it's not like a lot of modulations where it's like, okay, here we go up a step. Right. You know, it's yeah. almost kind of very subtle. You almost don't even realize it happened. You know? Yeah, I love to analyze, analyze songs and go, why is this a great song? And how did they pull that off? And what part of this song is great? And what makes me want to hear it over and over again? You know, when McCartney goes from B flat major back down to G in uh, Here, There and Everywhere, it's just so perfect the way he does it. He's ascending in one scale and descending in another, you know. So it's it's pretty 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 brilliant for a you know four scrubs from Liverpool to pull that off. Oh yeah, <laughs> I mean they they never cease to amaze, and I think the Beatles are just a, an essential part of any musician's DNA in this yeah. day and age. I, and I know some people that just kind of skip it and go, ah, oh, it's all pop. I don't. But wrong. There's so many lessons to be learned. Yeah hundreds you know i mean if yeah. you can go to learn you know go play a beatles night at some place and learn 10 yeah. songs and you will yeah. learn something new i promise yeah um, yeah if, if, if just from george harrison alone you know oh yeah and so, you know i've got to say george is my favorite slide player you know yeah. i'm always kind of intrigued by guys that are devoid of the typical ah, speaking of george i'm getting a call from a guy named george let me just tell him i'll call okay. him back yeah go for it Hey, George. Hey, man. Can I call you back? I'm right in the middle of doing an interview right now. Oh, good. Okay. All right. I sure will. Bye bye. So this is funny that you should mention George Harrison in that slide playing. This is a guy named George. I was producing his record for the last two days and playing on it. And the way I produce a record for a, an artist who is a guitar player who's a singer guy, you know, I have him sing on the basic, just a scratch vocal, and I play acoustic guitar. And I love to do it in this certain studio called Sunset Sound Studio 2, where Van Halen recorded. Because the ISO booth for the acoustic guitar is nice and big, and it has a perfect view of the, of the acoustic piano. And then when he moves out to play the organ or the Rhodes or the Wurlitzer, I can see him, then the drummer, and then the bass player, and I can actually even see the engineer. So I can run the whole session because I'm on acoustic, you know, I don't even need a talk back mic. And uh, so we did that on Tuesday, cut, cut five songs. And yesterday were the, was an overdub day. And, you know, I want him to play as much guitar on his own record as possible, which is, be honest with you, it's really frustrating for, for, for me. I just want to go, give me that thing. Sure. But he ended up being a really good slide player. And we took this one tune and said, why don't we do the George Harrison kind of thing with, you know, real plaintive kind of pretty slide, not bluesy, but what it is, you know, that, that a lot of slide downs and slide ups and stuff, and then harmonize it. And not, this guy, man, he knocked it out in two or three takes, which was really surprising. It's some of the best thing he did all day yesterday. Oh, that's such a beautiful sound. It reminds me, um, you know, that song from Jellyfish, New Mistake, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. That Lyle Workman did the double harmonized solo on yeah. slide. Great stuff. By the way, I don't know if you've heard Lyle's new album, but it is fantastic. I'm a of his, but I have not yet, but I'll check it out. Yeah, check it out. It's it's um, it's un Uncommon Measures. That's what it's called. I was trying to remember okay. it. And I'm he, that down. Yeah, he's got Vinny Caliuta on it, Abe Laboreal Jr. Um, uh, went to Abbey Road and, and did an orchestral uh, session or two so oh, it's great. it's beautiful it sounds like you know like symphonic fusion if you somehow yeah. mix zappa and an orchestra together and that's great man he's such a good guy i'm looking forward to listening oh yeah to i've had him on the show before and yeah he's he's astounding you know so very you know, cool I'm, I try to All plug right. that one as much but we but your album equally impressive uh sundown oh, thanks. so like tell me a bit about its genesis and Tell folks a little bit about your previous solo albums and how they differ from what you're doing yeah. now. And if there's been like an evolution, did you go kind of from hot shot instrumental guitar player to more of a vocal kind of guy or what? Yeah, I started off with a, a, a just an instrumental record. Then the second record I did called Garage Sale had two vocal tracks on it. And, um, you know, it, it's sort of like with instrumental records, in, in, in many, many cases, I end up buying them, checking them out, 
and filing them. And I don't really listen to them over and over again. There's a few amazing exceptions like Pat Martino's We'll Be Together Again. It's a jazz record, right? Sure. Um, and, and just a few exceptions, I would say. But for the most part, that's what happens. But the vocal records, I tend to embrace more. People like Sonny Landreth, right? Sure. Derek Trucks, you know, those kind of guys. Yeah. And um, uh, so, yeah, I, I guess I sort of evolved a little bit. And at some point, you know, in the 80s, we all had those big Bradshaw racks and we all had that very processed sound. Sure. And that's what you needed to make a living. You know, the police were really big and in excess and all those kind of bands. That was that sound. And I went from, I remember being, uh, doing a, uh, a show at a big club called the Key Club. Actually, it was Billboard Live at the time, it was called. Mm -hmm. And um, I had my Bradshaw rack and my amp rack, you know, two full on voting booths. Sure. And the whole, my whole concert was programmed into that, you know, to where you step on program one and it's the intro and then program two is the solo and then program three is the next song and, you know, and, or, you know, and things are changing like reverbs and delays and all that stuff. At that show, some stagehand guy tripped over the power cable of my thing and unplugged it and it plugged back in again and wiped all 99 programs. So now we're about to start this show and I've spent months getting it perfect and we've done other shows with it. So I, I knew it was just so confident that I knew that the sound for this solo was gonna just soar, you know. All right. he, he trashed it, there was nothing. And um, I go, what do I do, you know, and I, I I think I might have used a Fender Twin they had backstage and grabbed a tube screamer and something out of my car or whatever. And I had all these people come up to me and go, man, that's the best sound you've ever had. And uh, <laughs> it kind of made me realize that my, uh, my old Stratocasters through, um, you know, a blackface print Fender Princeton was a better sound than all that processing. Cause, sure. And I'm not knocking Bob Bradshaw. He was brilliant in making, you know, programmable effects loops. But what, what came to, to me was that when all that stuff was off, the basic sound of the guitar didn't really kill me, you know? Cause, so it occurred to me that you're listening to the delays, the reverbs, the chorusing, the harmonizing, all that stuff. Right. And so at, at the, by the time of my third record, which was 96, I think, I really became much more of a vintage guy. I mean, I was still using modern amps and modern guitars, but I was my sound became much more classic and less processed. And so those, from then on, the records sound a little less dated to me, you know? Sure. And, uh, they don't sound of a time. They sound, it's like Tom Petty. When you listen to a Tom Petty record, it, it, it doesn't sound like, oh, they did this in the 70s or the 80s or the 90s. It sort of sounds like classic rock. It sounds, it, it, it's sort of timeless to my ears. And maybe that's my age, I don't know, but. Uh, I, I so, agree. So yeah. when you ask about evolution, I have a bunch of my records lined up. I don't know if you can. Yeah, yeah. All the all those all those on that sh these shelves here, right, are 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 my albums. That's what I call my ego rack. Okay. And so uh, now, how uh, many of those are available now? If somebody wanted well, to they, go, well, they they really all are. I've made sure that if record companies die or go under or cease, I've kept things in print. So. And I believe I just made number 16. So I'm. <laughs> oh, wow. Awesome. Uh, now, where's the best place to get your, your albums at? I mean, the best place is probably carlverhyen.com because we, we're sending them records out every day, you know, mm -hmm. from here. We're, we're doing it. And uh, especially now that the new album is out, there's a lot of people that are adding to, you know, what do they call it? Add to store or whatever. Sure. You know, add, add to the. So people are buying multiple records and say, oh, I don't have this one or this one. So. That's kind of cool. So, but you know, um, I buy CDs, I buy vinyl. And, and, and one of the reasons I do is because I, I believe that uh, it's kind of like voting for this artist to make another record. Good you know, point, yeah. If you buy this latest record, you're voting for him to have enough money to do it again, you know, so. Sure. I think that's an important thing. We support each other, you know. That, that, Absolutely, yeah. I think that, you know, the physical media is still where it's at, you know, and. Um, you know. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, there's there's a whole generation that are not going to be collectors. You know, they're not going to have books. They're not going to have records. You know, and I understand that they just want to be 
devoid of any kind of encumbrances but yeah and i just have everything in a little box the size of a pack of chiclets you know yeah but it doesn't sound good <laughs> no but no. you know it, no. if you if you've never had caviar you might never miss its taste yeah that's true if you've I only guess. listened to hip-hop on a cell phone then it's yeah you know headphones. so much for high res <laughs> yeah, exactly you don't need it you just need a bunch of bass yep. <laughs> now did you where did you cut sundial at was it like a do you have a home studio you do a lot of work in or, or you did know you go to sunset? I've, kind of, I've, I've always felt until recently that i don't really want to be a home studio guy i want to be the expert on guitar sounds and tones and playing and hire an engineer who's the expert on you know getting it to tape or to to digital sure. stuff. Uh, so uh, I always track my records at real studios with real players, right? Um, then on this record, I did some tracking at Sweetwater Sound out in Fort Wayne because sure. they offered me a, a special package deal. They're and then awesome. I did a bunch of it at Sunset Sound, which is my kind of home base. And then I went to Criteria in Miami, which nice. incidentally I'm going to next week to do some project for very for cool. Producer. But I went to Criteria to do some background vocals and some singing and some overdubs. And then I was doing a session for somebody in Iowa, in Clear Lake, Iowa, where Buddy Holly died. They called me to come up there and do three days. And I said, hey, you know, can I buy a fourth day from you and track a few more overdubs? I want to redo this and fix that. And then I pretty much sang everything in my home studio. So I brought all the tracks home and sang here with an engineer. Well, I, I really love your voice. You've got a really, really? soulful, <laughs> bluesy thing going on. And I, oh, man. Thanks. Yeah, you know, it's just like, because I've heard, you know, some, you know, guys that are kind of known as guitar players kind of go the vocal route. And sometimes you're kind of like, eh. but you, you, yeah, I mean. Really? Well, wow, that's an honor, man. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I used to sing as a kid, like I got this job when I was, 17 my parents took us out to dinner in um, Pasadena where I come from and uh, as we're leaving this particular restaurant I saw this guy singing in the bar and I said you know I could probably do that so I went and asked the waitress can I audition for here and she said yeah come in tomorrow the owner will be here so I auditioned for him and I remember I played Crazy Love by Van Morrison and, you know, maybe a Beatles tune in my life or something. Like with acoustic kind of? Acoustic just... and vocal, right. And okay. the guy hired me on the spot. But then he nice. said, you are 18, aren't you? I said, no. He goes, well, come back. When do you turn 18? I said, three months. So he says, come back when you're 18 and you have the job. So I did. And that was great because I was really singing five nights a week and, and you know, playing all these, you know, Joni Mitchell and Jackson Brown and James Taylor, all that singer songwriter stuff that had to be the early seventies, you know, and yeah, well, uh, that's just a good gig for any young guitarist, you know, I just know, to really get is. used to working with just an acoustic, you know, you got to get your yeah. rhythm chops together pretty quickly. Yeah. So rhythm and finger picking and everything. And uh, so I did that for a couple years in that period and I was really singing and then I got into jazz, you know, um, this thing that happened to me was um, while I was at that club, this guy comes in and says, uh, this older guy, he says, can, he goes, I like the way you play, kid. You know, you want to get together and play sometime. And I said, sure. And he goes, how about tomorrow? So I went over to his house, some older dude. And uh, he put some music in front of me and the first chord was F major seventh, right? Mm -hmm. And I knew what that was, but the second chord was a D minor seven flat five. Ooh, okay. I didn't know what song it was. But I put I played a D minor and I go one two three four five. That's the fifth. Is that it? And the guy goes, well, you should finger it like that. This is a little richer because you could use the open string. It's nice to have a, a flat five on top. Some people like the flat five on the bottom. You could put the seventh on top. Seventh's good. This is one of my favorite voicings. A lot of people use this. Of course, this is probably the most common voicing. <laughs> this too. That's just an F major, uh, F minor six. So every every F minor six you have on the guitar is also that too. My brain exploded because he basically showed me 25 voicings of a chord I'd never even heard of till now. So I started down that kind of long, dark highway of jazz and I started just getting into it and studying it really heavily and practicing it eight hours a day for five years or so. And what, what year would you say you got into jazz? What year was it? I would say that was probably about uh, 73, 74, okay. right in there. And, and I, didn't, I didn't come out of that 
I didn't snap out of it until around 1980. Okay. Well, that was a great run. I mean, that's the whole peak of fusion and progressive rock. I yeah. mean, there's yeah. a lot to enjoy there. And a lot of my viewers uh, kind of are really into that stuff. So I was curious oh, yeah, if you too. had any, any early memories of seeing some of those great groups and just records by them that inspired you? And Yeah, as a matter of fact, you know, there's a, there's a song uh, by Herbie Hancock off the Thrust album called Actual Proof. Right? Oh, yeah. Funk gay. I've, I've been listening to that song all these years and never never understood it. So about two years ago, I was at the Hollywood Bowl backstage and I met Herbie Hancock and I said, I was playing at the Baked Potato the other night with these guys and they put a chart of actual proof in front of me. And I said, man, is that song hard? You know, I've, I've never understood it just listening to it. And I tried to read it and I, I pretty much folded because the sight reading on that was just impossible. But I said, this chart had a bar of five and a bar of three. Is that right? Or is it because I've heard a rumor that it's all in four? And he goes, yeah, it's all in four. <laughs> so I, I came back and, and made a new chart for myself and did, you know, like a deep dive into it and just said, I'm going to practice this a few hours a day for a week until I just own it. And mm -hmm. uh, I got it. And it was like this rite of passage for me, you know, 30 years, 40 years later, like, you know, if, if you if your listeners have never heard the song Actual Proof, you can check it out on YouTube. The, the, check out the original version, which is Herbie, uh, the album cover of Thrust with the with the space. Spaceship. Yeah, the space bubble. And he's like hovering over Machu Picchu. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah. Anyway, so I got it, man. I can play Actual Proof and I feel so good about it. I feel, I feel, I feel like, wow, if Herbie Hancock called me to be in his band, I wouldn't suck, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and all that Chick Corea stuff is so powerful, you know, and the and the weather report stuff and the Mahavishnu stuff. I mean, I, I just grew living in in that moment. Did you have the pleasure of seeing some of those groups live back yeah, in there? Pretty much everybody, yeah. So awesome. multiple times, you know. Awesome. And uh, so that that's th th then then one day, you know, probably around 1980, I was driving in my car and I was listening to the radio. I know exactly where I was. I was at the corner of Riverside and Laurel Canyon, and I heard I heard this Eagles tune. Speaking of them, mm -hmm. called "Those Shoes." Oh yeah, with the talk and box. Joe, yeah, Joe Walsh has just the most killer solo, and it, I kind of pulled my car over and went, "Man, the state of rock guitar has come so far since I left off in the '70s. I really need to, you know, this is the music of my people. What am I doing?" And at that moment, it's like I just decided. I, I, I wanted to learn how to play like Chet Adkins and, and Albert King and Mike Bloomfield again, you know, r visit those old roots that I had, the, the bending, the Eric Clapton, the Hendrix stuff, but then explore the country guys and the bluegrass guys and, uh, and uh, just if you dig it, you must learn it. And that's really, really been not only um, a big part of my whatever kind of success I've had in the studio scene, but it's really informed my own music because it occurred to me at some point, you know, I'm not bound by specialization. You know, I don't, as much as I think Stevie Ray Vaughan is just absolutely brilliant, it's not in my nature to play the blues only in, in three or four keys for the rest of my life, you know, because sure. I want to explore actual proof. <laughs> right, I hear you. <laughs> I want to explore, you know, all kinds of other kinds of music. And um, that's a real, that was a, uh, so, so Sundial, if you check it out, it's really kind of all over the place. It's, it's not a blues album or a rock album or a jazz album or anything. It's just a kind of an album. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering if we could talk about a few specific tracks. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about the opener, the title track. Yeah, that was a quirky little number that came about, uh, you know, I, I'm a practicer, as I know you are, you know, I just love to spend that time with my instrument, you know, you kind of find your center as a person. And I came up with a little riff and then I said, where can this go? And it started out as an instrumental. And then I thought, boy, some words would be fun to, to do on it. And uh, that track makes me smile to, you know, I mean, I now I've heard it enough, but I still just smile when I hear it. And um, I put in, uh, you know, it's a kind of this acoustic thing with a lot of acoustic piano. Then there's a big gnarly solo with an SG, mm -hmm. you know, and then and then 
I've got these background vocalists I used on it, and they just they just sounded glorious. You know, it was so nice. The the song lyrically, my wife will kill me if she hears me because she doesn't like me to tell you this, but you know, we've been married uh, almost forty years, which is pretty rare in the rock and roll business. You know. Oh yeah. And she's she's an amazing amazing um, supportive you know muse in my life, and I just love her to death. However. She has no minute hand, no concept of time. If I say we got to leave at three, she's ready about three forty-five. You know, three twenty. Oh, oh, <laughs> it's like wonderful tonight. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, yeah. And uh, she goes, "I'm going to go to the market. I'll be back in twenty minutes." And I go, "No, you won't. It's eight minutes to the market, and then you're going to be in there for fifteen minutes, and then it's eight minutes to get home. I'll see you. I'll see you in forty minutes. You know. Oh no, I can do it. No." So anyway, Sundial is a little bit about my coming to terms with the fact that, you know, there's no, there's no, no clock on the wall, no minute hand. You know, she's got a sundial that tells her what time it is, basically. So, awesome. Anyway. <laughs> I always thought sundials were neat things anyway. You know? Yeah, they're cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah it's a great image. I agree. I really like it. Yeah. Um, and how about the second tune, the instrumental? Is that Kaningi? It's called Kaningi. Kaningi. And, uh, Okay. Yeah, there's a, there's a Brazilian singer, Joel Gilberto, who has, we listen to his records like they're so beautiful, and he's got a kind of a croaky voice. And there's a there's one song where he's always going, Kaningi. <laughs> and we, so over the years, I've just called fingers Kaningis. Like, don't, my Kaningis are cold. Okay. And, uh, but I found out, I think that the word is actually an African language, Kaningi. Okay. And I, I have these African records, uh, like a three CD set of just African pop music that I picked up somewhere. And they've got that groove, you know, that and it's such an infectious groove. And so I, uh, I wrote that and I, and I used two drummers, Chad Wackerman and John Ferraro. Excellent. So Excellent. It's really, it's really kind of, you know, a wild frenetic thing with two drummers in the room, you know, two yeah. monsters too. So absolutely. I actually had Chad on a few weeks ago. So. Oh, great. Yeah. He's your old friend. Yeah. Yeah. He's awesome. Um, I've been playing with Chad since he was 18. Uh, <laughs> you know, he looks like he still is. I know. I know. Um, yeah. More or less. So. Yeah. Wow. Um, so I wanted to ask, um, when you do an instrumental song, what, what, boxes do you need to tick to make it feel like it's really a successful instrumental? Man, what a great question. I love it. Um, I think just a hummable, singable melody to start with, you know. And do you always start with the melody or are there times when you come up with the chord progression and then you put the melody on top after the fact? Yeah, you know, there's that too, because sometimes a great chord progression will dictate where the melody needs to go. Sure. And so... But uh, it's 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 a really interesting thing about songwriting. You can you can you can you can come at it from all points. You know, you can be walking down the street in a foreign country or something, and and just get a lyric idea or a you know a, a melodic idea. Um, or one of the things that I I think is is valuable for a guitar an improvising guitar player is to is to uh, as part of your practicing, and I don't ever compartmentalize my practicing. I never say I need to work on 15 minutes of classical and 20 minutes of sight reading, and that I never did that. I just inspired, tried to be inspired, and if I was into like transcribing a Sonny Rollins sax solo, I'd stick with that all week, and then I'm sick of Sonny Rollins, and now I want to play some blues, right? You know. So, sure. But but uh, one of the things that I really enjoy doing sometimes, and and I, and, I, and I do it nowadays with a wireless deal so I can turn up an amp loud in my studio and then walk around the house. And one of the things I do is I just play for the sheer joy of hearing the notes in the air, meaning, you know, I can just kind of demonstrate a little bit. If I'm in the, if I'm, if I'm in the key of F minor, I can just go and then come down in the key of B. You know, and, and then and then go up in E minor or E major, and then come down in D major, and then maybe go up in A seven, A my A flat major. You know, and so in other words, 
you, you just, what comes to mind, it's kind of cosmic in a way, I know, but it's kind of whatever comes to mind, just take it from there. And you'd be surprised at, at the riffs and licks and, and melodic ideas that happen when you do that, you know? Yeah, I know what you mean. Well, you know, since I've been doing this recording this, this year, you know, um, I go to the studio and I think I have the song done, but the next thing I know, an intro just comes out of the blue right? or an outro. Or, and, and sometimes what you thought or what you thought was a verse becomes the intro and now you got a better verse, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it, it's sometimes those things that just come out of thin air are my favorite parts, you know, it's yeah. like, gosh, I'm it's glad. It's great that you're happened. just open to letting that happen. And I think that's part of, part of this concept I'm talking about, you know, and, and, uh, uh, I, I, I try to do it as much as possible. I have a flying V and you can't sit down with it, right? Right. So that's a great guitar to just walk around the house and play standing up and, uh, you know, stroll through the kitchen and then into the living room and then, you know, just blasting away. <laughs> Rock it out around the house. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, so, um, so instrumental wise, um, I mean, you've done a lot of instrumental tunes over the years. Um, great melody, great arrangement. Um, what were some of your inspirations when it came to instrumental rock? I, I guess some of the fusion guys we were yeah, talking yeah. about. Um, well, you know, I, I started off really as a George Harrison fan. And then from that, I got into the fact that there, wait, there's, there could be like virtuoso guys like Clapton and Jeff Beck and stuff. Sure. And uh um, I got into I got into Dwayne and Dickey, you know the Allman Brothers, mm -hmm. uh, big Mike Bloomfield fan. So those are the early days. And then when I got into jazz, like people like Wes and Pat Martino became really important. Joe Pass, uh, and and uh, you know so I kind of got into incorporating that. And I would say, you know even the modern guys like McLaughlin and Pat Mar and Pat um, Matheny, you know some of those guys. And then uh, uh, I, I, I briefly flirted with the kind of Steve Vai, Joe Satriani uh, guys, you know, uh, oh, yeah. I briefly flirted with that a little bit. And then I really got into Stevie Ray Vaughan and I really got into, you know, uh, uh, Robert Cray, you know, uh, David Gilmour. Sure. You know, so they weren't really just total instrumental guys that you right. know, David Gilmour, you know, played in Pink Floyd. I had a fun a fun, uh, you know, uh, 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 meeting with him a few times and, you know, Dave Gilmore, what a great player. Just, just a vibe every time he plays. Oh yeah. Well, you know, thinking of, you know, with you a super tramp, it makes me think of brother, where are you bound? Cause uh, Dave yeah, yeah. guests on that big Epic that's on there. Yeah. That, that, that title tune. Yeah. And they, when they asked me, you know, can you, can you, uh, can you learn this solo note for note right when I joined the band and I go, well, it's like a five minute solo. I tell you what, why don't you let me start it like he starts and end it like he starts, like he ends and improvise in the middle. Yeah. And they'd never, ever done that. They'd only played their solos note for note, you know, on the yeah. record. So uh, Rick Davies, who's the leader of the band, he goes, we'll give it a go. <laughs> See how you do. So, you know, so I started to do it and, you know, I cued, they'd never had cues. They never needed cues. I cued the drummer like this is going to be the end, right? Right. And then after that, I said, "How about let me do that on Goodbye Stranger? I'll play the, I'll play the wah wah part that ascends, and then I'll just blow in the key of A flat. And if I'm feeling good, I'll keep this going for a while, and then cue the drummer for the ending." And uh, they said, "Okay, you know." And uh, <laughs> oh, I can was, imagine. I was gonna... slowly, slowly got him into that, letting you do whatever you wanted to do. No, I wanted to <laughs> talk a minute about. Roger Hodgson's guitar style, because mm -hmm. you've learned a lot of those songs. You probably know it better than a lot of people. And, you know, I think a lot of people don't even really think about his guitar playing. You know, you think of him singing at a, at a whirly and, uh, you no, know, he was, a, he was a, a great guitar player. I mean, when you listen to, you know, he, he's, he's an interesting guy. Cause like give a little bit is, is, you know, wonderful 12 string stuff with kind of some hippie chords you know what i mean with the open strings and you slide a form around oh sure and even love the song it. school has some of that you know we call them hippie chords great <laughs> tune great so, tune. yeah roger's great you know um i i i replaced him in the band and he went off to do this solo career but right as my solo career got going and i was playing these various theaters and big clubs and stuff like that 
he was coming attractions. And I'm going, why would you want to play these dinky joints that I play when you could be down the street at the 20,000 seater with Super Tramp, you know? Right. But I guess, I guess he really wanted to do what he wanted to do and uh, still doing it. And uh, it's, man, it's, I think they preserve his voice in amber or something, man. He, it, he never ages. He still sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. And that stuff's high, you know. That's I know he still has it. He still has that high stuff. That's going. great because you know a lot of his peers, you know, that that top end kind of erodes over the years. Yeah. You know, and it's like you know, I taught John Fogarty guitar lessons for about a year, like two, two or three a week. This was in the '90s, and I'm sitting right next to him, just as far away as you know, three feet away from him, and I, I'm trying to show him how Jimi Hendrix would play something because he had never really explored that R&B style, Curtis Mayfield, Jimi Hendrix, Steve mm -hmm. Cropper style of plan. And I said, well, let's take one of your songs. How about as long, as long as I can see the light? You know, what key do you do that in these days? And he goes, B, the original key, which means he's got to sing, oh yeah, he's got to sing that high B. And I go, man, you can still sing that B? And he goes, oh yeah, I sing much better now than I did in my famous days. Uh, you know, well, that's interesting. You know, I think a, a, a man's voice kind of does mature and kind of peak probably around his 50s if it's well, taken think, care yeah. of well. He's still you got know. it, though. You know, some of these guys, they're just bulldogs. You know, they just I, I kind of love it. Um, um, yeah. John Anderson from Yes is another one who just yeah. has this magical tone that just yeah. hasn't diminished, you know. He's he's an interesting guy because he talk, talks kind of high, too. Yeah, he does. Yeah, he's got the, the or northern... England accent going on in there as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So great stuff. Um, so Clawhammer Man, can you tell? Oh, yeah. about that one. And I'm taking you're referring to the technique. The guitar. No, no, I'm actually referring to tools. Oh, you are okay. I was. I figured with a name like that, you couldn't resist doing some kind of yeah. Clawhammer deal kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, you know, it, it's it's a funny thing. Um, there, there, there's a guy. I've got a female tour manager and she's the most efficient tour manager of all. And she's Swiss and uh, she's the kind that you must say, have great timing. Yeah. Perfect timing. And you say to her, um, Hey, tomorrow we only have an hour and a half drive. Why don't we see if we can get early check-in? She goes, oh, I did that two weeks ago. Yeah. Oh. So she's on it. She's really organized. And uh, I was telling her about this guy I know in LA. He, he works for JBL and, uh, He's talking along in a normal voice, but when he says the word tools, he'll say tools. <laughs> so he goes like, yeah, I could probably come over Friday because I, I, I think I have the right tools and I can be at your house with the tools. And, you know, <laughs> it's really a bizarre thing. So I told her about this guy. And so she says she says it every time every time she says the word we all do it now. The whole band does, you know, one of those band inside yeah. too many days on the road kind of jokes but uh anyway i i, I uh yeah it, it's 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 just kind of about uh yeah lyrically it's just more fun than anything else so okay <laughs> well i was gonna say i didn't really think i heard the claw hammer in there but i thought right. maybe it's tucked in a yeah that claw hammer uh, banjo style and everything yeah exactly yeah that's what yeah. it made me think of um but people got to be free you know oh, man. when Big you have a great, rascals fan you when know? you have a great chorus you start the song with it you know right yeah can't buy me love you know yeah oh gosh that's a george martin idea george martin says hey this is nothing but a blues why don't you start with your chorus and Mar oh, mccartney man. goes okay so but uh, yeah that that that's such a great song and uh, the the guys the guys on those tracks which is uh, once again the two drummers and uh bass and bass and um and uh b3 those guys are kind of in this little side project I have called the crank tones and it's just this you know we get together Christmas time and play a show we, we we or two you know kind of a Christmas with the crank tones thing and our our special guests are always like Albert Lee or Sonny Landreth and uh, Jerry Douglas did it this year or last year and um, it was supposed to be in December we were supposed to have Larry Carlton as the special guest but they had to cancel because of the COVID thing right but uh, it's a really fun band that isn't my band. It's kind of, I'm, it's, it is kind of my band. I, I'm the guy that gets all the gigs and writes all the charts. But I got, I got them doing that. People got to be free as a ska tune. And uh, we, we started doing it that way. And then the funny story is when we went to record it, 
I don't know what I had written. I've got the chart in my filing cabinet here. I probably wrote 145 metronome marking, you know. And in the Xerox or something, it got it, it came out like 165. <laughs> so I said, give me a 165 click. So we did it at 165. And when we finished, we all looked at each other and laughed. And I went into the control room and told the engineer, we got to do this again. It was not supposed to be 165. It's way out of control. And he goes, no, that's the best part about it, man. It's faster than hell. It's just incredible. So much energy. So uh, we kept it. We kept that first take at 165. <laughs> that is funny. That is so, funny. Yeah. yeah. What a great song, though. Yeah. Yeah. I really like it. Um, and then the, the closer sundial slight return little tip. Oh yeah. I mean that, there. see that was the, the original idea for that sundial song was going to be just an instrumental. So I thought, wouldn't it be nice to just close the album with that theme again, you know? And, uh, and, uh, that's, that's basically a minute and a half thing with some different, a few different textures. I played it on the nylon string. I go, what, what haven't I used, <laughs> you know? So yeah, I, some different textures going on there. That was beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about transcribing and how it's kind of evolved in the computer age versus how you did it back in the 80s. I mentioned back yeah. in the 80s, did you do the old trick where you pull the headphone jack out halfway so you just hear one side and you can kind of hear the... a little of that, yeah. yeah. I mean, I slowed my turntable down before that, you know, and then uh, I think the kids have it easy now with YouTube being able to be half speed and stuff. You can oh, learn, sure, yeah. Really I mean, learn stuff much faster. Um, it, it started for me where I would go, I'm going to transcribe this entire solo, all eight choruses. And whether, whether it was, uh, whether it was a, a, you know, a horn player or a piano player or a guitar player. And then as it evolved, I started to say, really what I want to know is those five bars. Cause I don't know what's going on there. You know, just get those two licks that are just amazing. And then the evolution of it, I remember being in Paris one time in a hotel, in my hotel room, and it was pouring down rain. And I've been to Paris, you know, many, many times, so I don't need to really go sightseeing again. And I had no guitar with me, and I decided to, um, I decided to transcribe Green Onions, right? Mm -hmm. By ear, on the couch, as opposed to on the guitar or the piano. So... Real simple melody, you know, the B Booker T. Sure. And I did it. I transcribed the whole thing. And then when I got with my guitar, I, I, I played it along my transcription. I write it out, right? Played it along with the, uh, with the record. And I got all but like two notes. So then I said, next time I'm going to try Freddie the Freeloader by Miles Davis, which is off Kind of Blue. And Miles, you know, real simple, easy to do solo. So that, but that was a step harder. And so sure. I've been kind of working, trying to work the ear that way, you know, as opposed to note for note off YouTube or whatever. But yeah. um, did you uh, do some of the obvious classic rock stuff that was in all those guitar magazines back in the 80s and 90s? Did you? Did I transcribe it? Yeah. Did you do some of that kind of stuff as well? I mean, I, I wasn't getting hired to do it, no. no I, okay. I, I didn't really have the time, it seemed, you know, like I couldn't. You must really... have you confused with somebody like Jesse Gress or somebody. Yeah, that guy's great at transcribing. He's yeah, a yeah. Monster. I like his columns and stuff. He's cool. I do too. And I, I love he him when he plays Todd. with Todd Rundgren too. Right, he plays with Todd, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. So Excellent. Cool. Um, okay, well, just a few more questions here. Um, yeah. What's a few chordal moves that you love? Oh, that's a great question. Well, I could tell you that I take my, um, I take my, here, I'll grab this one here. All my guitars are still in the trunk from, so I, I take a chord like this, a triad, an A triad, and uh, so, and I take the middle note out and put it up here. So I get one, five, three, and I do that to every inversion. So, can't really reach it on this thing. Right? And then, and then if you think you, you have those kind of modern voicings, right, that, that, are, that are just triads, then you think, okay, I could put a, a D in front of that A chord, and so it can sound like, um, 
let's say, you know. Like this. And basically, I, I, I'm just going 5 1, right? Right. I'm, I'm sorry, 4 1. 4 1. So, 4 1. gets cool if I can be in the key of A and play one to four and then I can play a G with the third in the bass and then I can make it E flat you see and then I can make it um, B flat and F and then maybe uh, D flat E flat you know, in other words, you start to get these inversions, and you can mess with them too. You know, like uh, uh, have some some. Uh... <laughs> this whole thing, this is a '59 D18. Not, you know, it's much better for this kind of stuff. Anyway, but those kind of things, um, they. They open up the they open up the tonality of the guitar. You know, I love I love intervals when I'm improvising, and so I started to think, what if I had bigger intervals in my chords? With that, so my chord isn't this little stack like this, but it's more like this, this, and this. You know, it makes me think of Alan Holdsworth. Oh yeah, Big Al, yeah. You know, and, and the way I he love that it. guy. And I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about him playing on your first album. Oh yeah, yeah. He he. Um, I guess. I guess Chad was the one who probably introduced us because Chad Thanks, got man. that gig pretty early on. And then Alan used to, you know, we used to, I used to be able to go to his house and jam with him. And uh, that was pretty wild, you know. I was going to say, hands, was that at all hands, intimidating or? Uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah. His hands were so big and he's very humble and very modest. And when he played on that album, you know, he just felt, oh, I don't deserve to play on your record and all this stuff. And I go, are you kidding, man? Oh, I don't he's so be humble and he kind of hates everything he plays, even I though know, it's yeah. brilliant. You know. Yeah, I know. So, um, yeah, the the last time I saw him, he was still pretty healthy. But then that was about maybe six, seven years ago. And then I heard he just got just, you know, alcohol, yeah. alcoholed out, you know. Yeah. So, But I really, I really cared for him and he, he taught me a lot and he... He made, you know, when when he plays those chords of his that that are that are subhuman, you know, they're just another, another tendonitis in the waiting in the wings, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I went. I, I decided to. Uh, I, I was playing this that song Three Sheets to the Wind. Sure. Yeah. With him and uh, at his at his house, and I was trying to comp for him to solo. And I could barely make those chords. Oh, so man. I went home and just locked myself in the room and shut the door and said, I am not coming out of here till I can play those chords just as easy as he did. What and, made it easier? Just the repetition or did you manage yeah, to stretch you know, your tendons a bit? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, if you go from a chord you play all the time, like just a C chord to that chord and then back and forth, you know, five dozen times, I think you're going to start to get it down. But uh yeah, I love. I really liked him. You know, he was a cool guy, and it's, it's interesting because his records do bear repeated listening. You know. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, it's a wealth of wonderfulness that just yeah, exactly. stops giving. Really, I mean, there's so much to dig into. Um, tell us a bit about your work, um, your session work on commercials and and soundtracks. What, are, you know, your website says that we probably hear you every day, but we don't realize it. So, what's yeah, yeah, what's yeah. a few things we've heard you on that we could point out? Well, I've done a ton of movies and I've done a lot of records and a lot of a lot of TV shows, a lot of jingles. I did every episode of of Cheers and I'm pretty much the only guitar player you ever hear when you do hear guitar on like Seinfeld and Married with Children and uh you know, there's just hundreds of those kind of sitcom TV shows I did. Mm -hmm. And then there's hundreds of movies too. Um I played on uh I played on the Malagro Beef Beanfield Wars, which won an Oscar for the soundtrack. Yeah. That yeah. was me, Lee Rittenauer, and Angel Romero, which was cool. Wow. And I played on Ratatouille and Cars and uh, Up and all those Pixar films. And, those are great. Um, 
And, you know, I've played on a lot of people's records like the Bee Gees and I played on a Cher record. And uh, you, you played know, Dolly Parton. Yeah, I played with Dolly. I did what? nine to five with her, I think it was, or Straight Talk it was. Oh, yeah. yeah. Tell us a little bit about working with her. Well, you know, she's really funny. And okay. I was in a I was in a folding chair at Ocean Way Studio with my guitar, and she's sitting four feet away from me. And she goes, "What are you looking at?" <laughs> I go, "Oh, nothing, Dolly, you know, or something like that." And she goes, uh, "You know why Dolly's waist is so thin? Because nothing grows in the shade." <laughs> and then she starts giving me a, a you know a handful of Dolly Joe's. She's really cool, yeah. sweet as can be. And, and she's an amazing musician. I think people. Yeah don't really realize but her pitch is spot on it's yeah. impeccable and um her guitar playing is pretty cool you know i think yeah. sometimes she just tunes to like an open chord because her fingernails are so long but i know yeah but uh, she's great she i got nothing but respect for her yeah so. she, she's just an awesome person she just radiates goodness you know yeah world hey what uh world. what um if i can ask you a question sure. where when and where does your show air and and how can i can tell oh. people about it yeah okay well I'll tell you what um you have contact information on your website i can send you a copy of the edited version when i get my intro attached to it and all that jazz great and yeah I, have well, a um, I thought you even sent me something if you didn't i'll tell you crank tone at gmail so c-r-a-n-k-t-o-n-e crank tone that would be great yeah i'd love it if you could share this on your social yeah i'll, I'll put it on uh instagram and all that facebook stuff that'd be and, great because a great, great chat great. i want as many people to hear it as possible yeah, you know? great. Um, but basically my show is called soul night live s-o-a-l stands for story of a life because each one of these shows is biographical in nature whether it's about a person or a band or even a genre sometimes yeah. we'll take you know do a whole show about the history of progressive rock or fusion or whatever. Very cool. Um, so you can find it at backslash soul night live. Nice. At, okay, great. At YouTube. Yeah. And I've been doing this since May. It was kind of a COVID inspired thing. Um, right. And I, a few people kind of inspired me, you know, Rick Beato has a fantastic series. Yeah, it does. And, um, and there's a guy out of Nashville named Tom Bukovac. Who you He's might awesome. Know. Yeah. Yeah. What, what a nice tone he gets. I, I dig oh. him too. He, he's awesome and he's uh, he's got some great taste and he's kind of into some progressive rock stuff too which i think great. is yeah him and his wife did some wonderful genesis covers that are just wow here jerking and not like invisible touch but like you know 70s yeah. genesis yeah, one. The, the gabriel stuff yeah yeah and just a a wash of 12 strings arpeggiating together beautiful yeah. stuff so that's a wonderful sound man it really is it really is it's kind of organic you know it's just yeah just yeah. dry well, as know, we should we should do a part two sometime i'd know? love to yeah um, I, I i'm kind of pressed for time and then i gotta uh, go to an engagement party of my nephew don't sweat it carl um you know it, i'd love to do maybe a kind of a guitarist round table thing sometime in the future Ooh, that'd be great. if you could join us that would be fantastic you know so yeah. maybe sometime this summer um, i'll reach out to you and we'll try and put something together yeah okay. now that you have my email you know you can get a hold of me directly and we can fire that up That's that sounds cool. great that sounds great uh well remind everybody one more time where to get sundial at the new album yeah the new album sundial it's at carl and that's c c a r l and verheyen is spelled like verheyen v-e-r-h-e-y-e-n.com and so that that you know if you search for carl blah, 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 you're gonna find me pretty much but uh <laughs> right but uh, yeah, you can get it there, and it will be in all the all the record stores as of the 9th of April. Mm -hmm. But uh, if people are even getting out and going to record stores during COVID, I don't know if they're shuttered or not. But. Uh, no, no, a lot of them aren't. As a matter of fact, that's one of the few places I go. I kind of go out vinyl hunting about once every week or two and hit Great. the used stores. But they have a lot of new stuff in there, too. So. Yeah, very uh, cool. Yeah. Thankfully, it's yeah. one place I can go. <laughs> yeah, I know. Very cool. Yeah, where are you located? I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. Oh, great. Man, I love yeah. that town. Yeah. My band about three years ago played the City Winery. Oh, yeah, that place. You know, it's funny. That's the old Sears building. They, oh, wow. They redid it. You know, it was built in 1928, one of the oh. biggest buildings in Georgia at the time. Wow. And the City Winery was the automotive department. So basically yeah. playing down in the basement where they kept the tires and the oil and all that jazz. Because yeah. it's and, really beautiful. Oh, it is. I mean, it's just brass, it's brass and wood and just really classy looking and yeah, great. Room. High, our, our, 
our opening act was Andy McKee, and he was wonderful. Oh, he's fantastic! Yeah, yeah. isn't he the acoustic pl yeah. player? Yeah. I think he's. Yeah. I think he's from my hometown of Topeka, Kansas. Really? Surprisingly. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, City Winter, Rindery's great. I've seen a few shows there. Adrian Ballou and his trio. I saw them. Um, yeah. Terry Bozio, kind of. Terry Bozio and his drums. <laughs> yeah, Terry and his one-man show. Isn't that an amazing show? It totally is. I mean, you know, you see that and you think, this is the height of excess. But then you watch the show and it's like, no, he uses every damn piece of that kit. You know, yeah, it's he's not. He's playing melodies and he's playing songs. It's pretty cool. I yeah. thought one giant long drum solo i don't think i can sit through that and boy it was the exact opposite i went with I, Luke with her. I remember he had those tune toms almost like chromatic and i remember when he yeah. toured he took that kit i saw him with jeff beck you know he's toured jeff beck on and off yeah, i saw those shows yeah that was cool. and it's like they were doing that riff to scatterbrain you know that da -da 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 and he like yeah. just spit it back at jeff on those toms it was amazing i know yeah. so it was really yeah we 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 have the same agent and um especially for Europe, we have the same agent for Europe and that, and uh, apparently there's a day to set that stuff up a day. I can so, imagine, you know, he's got a guy that gets there a day early, sets up all that stuff. And then he shows up and okay. plays. Yeah, I'm surprised he doesn't have two of them and just piggybacks them. Like yeah, if, maybe he does. Yeah. that's <laughs> You know, kind of like guys do with their whole stage, like pig Floyd had piggyback yeah. their stage, you know, to, yeah, they, they gotta have two of everything. It's that's crazy, wild. man. So, well, well, Carl, thanks a man. I thoroughly yeah, enjoyed yeah. our chat. And uh, I'll be in touch. We'll just put something together for the summer. Great. Love it. Thank All you right. so much. I really appreciate hey, it. My pleasure. Always fun All to right. talk guitar. <laughs> right. Yeah, I hear you. All Take right. care. See you, Carl. Bye-bye.